Riddle me this, viewers. If humans and replicants are so much alike, then what's the difference? Especially if, God forbid, they decide fuck and engineer a whole new race. This is one of the things that pissed me off about Blade Runner 2049. It tells more or less the same story as Blade Runner, follows the same philosophical prompt as the first, and leaves us with just as many questions unanswered. Only now, it's bigger, longer, more bloated, with a few minor alterations. Dennis Villeneuve uh, spreads the story razor thin over nearly three hours, whereas Ridley Scott, even in his final cut, wrapped it up in two. Do not underestimate the importance of the time to plot ratio. It is as crucial to a film as the meat to bread ratio in a sandwich, and this movie is mostly bread. Scott is a director more focused on finishing a story in the most concise terms possible than in perfecting an aesthetic. Why do you think all those deep themes seem way more impressive looking back on Blade Runner? You think he intentionally made that his masterpiece? No, he had a great story. That's how most great movies begin. You remember the story. By contrast, 2049 is thematic concentrate. All smoke, little fire. Judged on its own merits, it's a fascinating shell of a film, and absolutely worth seeing. But it's nowhere near as good as the original. To start off, there are some very basic variations on the first film. The replicants have discovered the lost art of lovemaking, and they can now reproduce, something I guess the Blade Running police never really thought about. And if you've seen Blade Runner, you'll recall that Harrison Ford's character, Rick Deckard, thought he was a human, but then by the end of the first film realized he might be. Oh, a replicant. But see, it's up to you. The mystery must be preserved. Now, 30 years later, we follow a man named Kay, played by Ryan Gosling. He's a Blade Runner who knows he's a replicant, so he's well adjusted to the act of murdering his own. Then one day, he receives some updates on a childhood memory, which cause him to have feelings about it. He has one very brief, I'm adopted, outburst. That's the most acting we ever see from Gosling. Was the memory implanted, or did it really happen? And if it did really happen, who did it happen to? Could he be not what he thinks he is also, like Harrison Ford? You see, this is not a sci-fi movie that's interested in delineating between humans, replicants, and or mixed breeds. We're supposed to take this moral quandary at face value and accept the characters with open arms no matter who or what they are. I didn't buy it, simply because the characters are not easy to relate to in the first place. It doesn't matter whether they're they're more human or less human, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that we can relate to them, and they don't even have enough good lines to get us on board. Like his previous film, Arrival, Villeneuve is more hypnotized by the look of his film and the steel reserve of his characters. Steel reserve, by the way, is a toxic malt liquor that could never be mistaken for a craft beer. And I'm just as easily fooled by Villeneuve's insistence on unnaturally elongating every minuscule moment of his film. Steel reserve in a champagne glass, this is. Visually, this film is, oh, oh, creme brulee. So smooth, silky, sweet, and luxurious when you first dive in. It's a full body orgasm that may cause one to jizz himself in the theater. But it's not just one full serving of creme brulee. This film is a creme brulee pie. Have you ever eaten a whole fucking pie? Maybe if you're one of those self-loathing competitive eaters or an emotional eater. But by the time I was halfway through this pie, I was having second thoughts. Every scene seems like an hour and a half, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I appreciate films that take their time, but every scene? You do know part of your job is yelling cut, right? Spielberg does long scenes and long takes extremely well. They're usually accompanied by some vital exposition that's relevant to the plot. It really helps pad the scenes out, it gives them some, you know, substance. The problem is, there is not enough substance here to justify the length. Plot is important, yes, not necessarily in the traditional sense, but give us how, how about some snappy detective dialogue? Give us some more action, something needs to pick up the slack here. 
there is a lot of slack. And we can only view the characters from a long shot distance. Gotta see how much space we can fit in the frame. They shall forever remain an enigma. We can never know. So what are we left with? Breathtaking imagery. The universe of Blade Runner is still one of the most unique in the history of cinema. This is one of the few worlds I could revisit again and again and again if the story wasn't as empty as OJ's homecoming party. First hour or so is top notch. It's excellent. Fantastic world building, something the Star Wars prequels did very well. We get transported from here to there, different places, we get a broader scope. This sequel unlocks levels. And like in a video game and the opening sequence with the tea kettle is superb somebody took screenwriting 101 and uh, We follow Ryan Gosling's replicant killing replicant who goes by the name of Kay What a terrible fucking name for a kid honey. I just spit out a crying turd Kay What should we name Kay Gilbert? <laughs> you know piece of shit and, and even if he is a replicant still why why do you name your people that jesus now i'm not taking off points for ryan gosling's performance he is serviceable for sure but he is no harrison ford uh he gosling is all the charisma of a high school history teacher now he doesn't derail the movie but he's never been a great lead actor i don't know how these canadians keep getting away with shit but... uh, another thing i loved about the film is the setup for the love interest uh, Kay comes home to a holographic girlfriend named Joy. She's a product put out by the Tyrell Corporation. Her setup is funny, it's absurd, there's some veiled satire, and I bought the relationship with Joy. You can see how lonely people would fall for her. She's a hologram that you can freeze frame anytime you want. She's portable, you can put her in your pocket whenever you want, then when you want dinner, you just... She just pops out of the remote. The perfect woman. I could settle down with that. You can tell the filmmakers really wanted to revisit this theme of love, a concept that remains foreign to me, and the callbacks to the original worked well too. It almost felt like Wall-E, no shit. And I wanted to see more of this absurdity, more billboards that come to life and shake their asses, more of this futuristic satire on consumerism that Ridley Scott always ran parallel to the action. That's what made the first movie so dazzling. That city was an ever-present backdrop. Shouldn't it be even more densely populated 30 years later? Why does it look less crowded somehow? This doesn't make any sense. But when Villeneuve's vision takes over, it's not so foxy. He embarks on one too many detours outside the city. There's this ghetto daycare center run by a homeless dude, and that's giving him the benefit of the doubt. We don't know what he's doing with these kids, but he's black, so I don't think he's a pedophile. Have you seen a black pedophile? That's racist! Oh, okay, okay, minor detail. Quibble, I'm overthinking that. Back to the point I was making, that whenever the film steps outside of that city, shit hits the fan real quick. But there's still so much shit going through that fan that some of it comes out on the other side. I like the scenes with the police force. Robin Wright gives a standout performance as the head of the precinct, and she almost fetishizes Gosling. It's heavily implied that she could probably order him to give up the D. That's some strong stuff. And I love characters who toy with their own authority. I also like the scenes in the yellow Tyrell pyramid structure with Jared Leto being a total fucking Jared Leto. Now for once, the context of the character actually complements his antics. His scenes were some of the most captivating in the film. But the second hour is when the bridge collapses, where the head starts to go up the ass. Harrison Ford is given morsels to work with in his long-awaited return. We are left to wait nearly two endless hours of elegaic scenery before Rick gets his big coming out of the shadows moment and we wait forever and when he finally comes out as his moment of truth dun 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 <laughs> fail fail and they fight for five minutes like children and it's not funny it looks good but it's stupid what are you doing movie I wanted to shout fail fail and you can tell the movie's grasping at straws for a reason to get Harrison Ford involved in this other than the marketing, but there isn't. They never team up. There's this hacky subplot about a long lost child that Jared Leto wants because she's the chosen one. And to me, 
That's a giant MacGuffin at best. Stop with the child shit. We've seen this before. Fuck that. I've had enough of this legacy shit. Every sequel and reboot pulls. And whatever the reason, Harrison Ford's character was really just poorly handled, even though he puts in a decent performance. And there's also this god-awful scene in the middle, uh, where the holographic girlfriend invites his hooker to sync up with her so with her movement so they can pleasure Ryan Gosling. It's dumb as cum and adds nothing to the proceedings. There's also a whole subplot about a replicant uprising that's laughable. There's a whole army of us and then they come out of their shadows. What is this, the Hunger Games? Wrap it up. Does everything have to be political now? If, replicant, if replicants feel all the same emotions, to the point where they question whether or not they're human, then what's even the conflict here? You might as well have made this movie about rich versus poor, Israel versus Palestine, whatever. If Rick Deckard is in fact a replicant, which story never definitively answers, then replicants can age just like humans. Can we get at least a, maybe an action scene here to balance that out? The score sucks shit, the saxophone gets replaced with just Cool your engines, folks. This is not as good as the first. The first is a classic. The final cut is a near-perfect film. This, is, this isn't even close. Blade Runner is a film noir for tit's sake. And as much as I appreciate the, the film's very clean, sort of nubial porn look where they open the curtains and natural lighting and they fuck with class and elegance, no sweat or tears... I don't think Villeneuve and Deacons understand that the world of Blade Runner is not like that. This world is supposed to be this this smoky, murky, crime-ridden underworld with Chinese people stacked so high that they spill into your windows and smoking. Why does nobody smoke in movies anymore? What the fuck? Why not cut Ryan Gosling's balls off while you're at it? What's the point in making it look pretty? You're not doing it any justice. Just respect the source material. If you're making a sequel, if you didn't want to make a sequel and make your own movie, that's fine. But then, why are you sticking with this title and this universe if you're gonna do it your own way? And again, this thing could have had at least a half hour chopped out and it would have been a better movie. And don't get me wrong, I love the entrancing portraits of Roger Deakins as much as the next guy. That's all window dressing. What's happening in the frames? Not very much. Ryan Gosling, there are scenes where he's just softly tiptoeing around sets that look like modern art exhibits at museums. Like, dude, can you walk? No one's following you. What is this self-conscious horse shit? It's like, are, are you, is the cameraman creeping you out? Like, what the fuck is going on? Where are the packed alleys and street fights? So as you can guess, this is a very flawed sequel to a great movie. It needs at least as many revisions and a better sense of humor. But this is one of those films that makes you think it's too smart for you because it's stylistically inert and elusive. It's like that untouchable hot girl at school who every guy wants to go out with, but then you realize she only sleeps with teachers to get the grades. Not as complex as she wants you to think. Pretty basic. But once I read the synopsis on Wikipedia, it all fit together. You know, philosophical questions aside, its primary flaw is it's just... It, it's constipated. How many blanks should we be expected to fill in? I like thinking about the hard-boiled style and the deeper meanings of Blade Runner, not about the pretty pictures and stale performances of Blade Runner 2049. After an early string of taut thrillers, Villeneuve entered a realm he seems a lot less capable of, science fiction. Arrival was a misstep on every level. By contrast, Blade Runner 2049 is a step back in the right direction, because it has so much to draw from. This is not just a shitty reboot, and there's something to be said for that. And there's so much that I liked about it. the overall experience was very alluring, and that's why I'm probably going to see it again. That's why you should see it. It is very alluring. So for now, I'm giving it a 7 out of 10.